ultimately probably have a lot more uh, to share with you than even we do. So um, please utilize all of us here to really kind of help you through this process learn more about scoliosis. So thank you. to uh, welcome you all as well. This is uh, meant to be a, a fun day, something where you get to uh, get to know some other folks, other uh, people with scoliosis, and, and other clinicians uh, who you can ask questions to, uh, and just really try to find out as much as you can, share as much as you can, uh, and get to know some of the, the folks that are uh, here with you. The, uh, the foundation that is sponsoring this is called Setting Scoliosis Straight. And this uh, group, or foundation, is a nonprofit that came out of the work of the HARMS Study Group. And the HARMS Study Group is a research organization of clinicians who, many of the folks that are here, collaborate with, their, uh, with each other and collect data from their patients and put it together into a large registry where we can use that, that data to power uh, research studies best practice guidelines, make advice to surgeons, make advice to patients to help improve the care of scoliosis. But that foundation uh, also has a mission to educate both surgeons and patients and families. And so we're working on that part of the mission today by uh, having a forum where patients and families can share and be educated and uh, get to know each other. So uh, I think this is, uh, there'll be more uh, about that foundation and uh, it's uh, history uh, by Michelle at the end of the day, but uh, we've got uh, an exciting program uh, for everybody today. And um, Pete, are you up next, or where are we going next? I just want to do one, one last thing. Sorry. Uh, so one last uh, thank you, but also I think it's really important. Is uh, sometimes people ask, well, what, what are we? What are what are the metals we use? What are the technologies we use? And various other things like that. And so uh, I do want to thank the sponsors and. There are tables outside that you get to put your hands on some of the metal embracing that, you know, we always get, can we see what, uh, what's used in scoliosis surgery and so forth. So uh, a lot of the technologies we use are outside there, uh, and they are uh, all sponsors of this program as well. So they're all uh, companies that are interested in um, really uh, pushing forth patient education and bettering uh, the treatment of scoliosis. So thank you. So next we're going to have uh, Pete uh, Marzano, who is, uh, well, I'll let you talk. <laughs> Thanks very much, everybody. And Michelle, we may get to this slide or not. Okay, thank you very much. So good morning. I'm Pete Marzano. I'm here today with my daughter, Isabel, or Izzy Marzano. And Izzy, we're both based in San Diego. Uh, we are family ambassadors, if you will, Izzy being a patient-specific ambassador. And she was diagnosed with scoliosis two years ago. She's currently a seventh grader, diagnosed as a fifth grader. And we're here today to really share our journey. And as you can tell by the slides above us, we're two years into the endeavor. But to help share what we've learned over the course of this time to help answer some of the questions, demystify the diagnosis a little bit, and really share from a parental or a patient experience what has transpired over the last couple of years. Because just like you, many of you, we were at the doctor's office with Dr. Newton and got our first x-ray and said, holy cow, that doesn't look straight, right? And then we, right now we're embracing it, and we are very experienced in that endeavor two years in. So, and you'll see us later on a patient panel. So as you go through today, you know, we're trying to share our experiences to you to help take the edge off what might be new. We're a little bit scary to you. And we're happy to do that via this vehicle today. We are open to contact later on. And what I'm really proud to say is two years in, on the far right hand side, Izzy has done a lot of good work working with Dr. Newton and the team here at Radies to conservatively manage the, the, the progression of her disease. So the bracing is working for Izzy. So I encourage you, for those of you that are about to brace or embracing, participate in that discussion and share your experience or learn from that experience today. And there's a couple of things I'd like you to remember as you come out of this. If you remember three things today, just remember these three things and take them to heart or apply if you will. Educate yourself. 
I mean, congratulations first and foremost for all of you being here today to take that first step, to learn more. You want to be educated. You want to understand what this means and what it might entail for your journey moving forward. There's a lot of information out there, some of it fear-mongering misinformation. I think you'll find in this environment and the, the resources that are provided through this organization and beyond, a lot of great information, factual base that will help you better understand everything. The second thing, ask questions. Don't be passive. This is an unbelievable environment for you to engage with might be your surgeons or world-class surgeons from around the country, the doctors that have been experienced this for years and years, ask questions. This is a great environment. Go home and ask questions. The doctors, the physician's assistants, the nurses, the teams at the hospital and beyond, they're there to serve you, to help you become more educated and aware of what your journey will be both now and moving forward. And lastly, as depicted by this slide, you know, scoliosis is a diagnosis. It's not a life sentence. So for the kids out there, go out and have fun. Be yourselves. Don't let this knock you back. It's going to be a little bit different, a little bit scary. You may have to architect your day a little bit differently if you're going to the bracing like we have. But you can go out and be a kid just like you always have and encourage you to do so. Because there's nothing that you can't do today that you couldn't do a year ago. So with that, I'll turn it back over to our moderators, Dr. Newton here, and I encourage everyone to really enjoy the day. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot. Perfect lightning. I think I'm starting things off. And uh, we're going to start off with, what is scoliosis? We better, we better answer that question before we get too far along. And I suspect uh, the reality is, you know what scoliosis is because that's why you're here and uh, it's called the power of scoliosis and if it said the power of tibia fractures we'd have a different group in here right now but uh, it says scoliosis so let's do it but by the way that uh, that picture uh, uh, by Eve Moll was uh, painted uh, several years ago and was presented at uh, one of the first courses that we had and uh, she had her artwork on display last night uh, at our gala as well. So uh, beautiful uh, image. And there's a there's a better story that goes with it that I unfortunately uh, can't tell. But uh, that bridge has significance and all the colors. It's really beautiful. So the um, we have to have a little bit of anatomy lesson. I promise this is going to be very much because uh, this isn't what we're really here. But the, the spine is what where the disease is, and we have to have some sense of the anatomy. But basically, we have a vertebral column that runs down the middle of the body, attached to that uh, ribs. And the ribs become important because a lot of the deformity that we see in scoliosis is related to the ribs. But these vertebrae have different anatomic landmarks that become important for the surgeons, as they work, may be a little less important for you. I promise you don't have to have uh, remember all the names of those little things that are identified there. So, uh, scoliosis, uh, we see from the, the front or the back and the side. And obviously this is a, a curvature of the spine, in this case uh, fairly substantial. But it is more than just a frontal plane curvature of the spine. This is the, the place we spend most of our time looking. I'm sure it's the thing you look at if you, when that first x-ray goes up, is that thing is supposed to be straight from the front and it's not. And uh, what's going on. But it, it turns out that if we look at this in a more three-dimensional sense, a lot of these curves have a very complex uh, interaction between uh, the shape of the vertebra. In some of these cases, the vertebrae aren't even the right shape to begin with. There's an embryologic uh, malformation of the vertebra, so they just didn't get made right straight away. But uh, uh, the vertebrae become wedged, they rotate and twist. So this is a very complex three-dimensional deformity that uh, is, even in the mildest curves, there's a three-dimensional deformity to this that is uh, important to understand. So what is it that, that you see? How does this look on the outside of the body? Because that's how you see it. That's how we make the diagnosis, or your primary care docs make the diagnosis. And it results in shape changes to the body that, uh, in each of these cases, are a little bit different. But you can, you can see there's a uh, difference in the heights of the shoulders in some cases. There's some um, uh, differences in the shape of the shoulder blades, or the position of the shoulder blades. The shoulder blades sit on the rib cage, and that 
rib cage deformity that we talked about earlier uh, makes those shoulder blades stick out a little bit asymmetrically. You may see some differences in the waistline crease. Uh, and as I sort of show you these on one, you can see them on the other examples. So let's, uh, let's move on to why this, how the ribs become misshapen in scoliosis. So as the spine curves, it also rotates and twists. And that twisting pushes the ribs up on one side and down on the other side. And so a lot of this deformity that you see when you bend forward, and this is a test that's often done in the office to try to find out if scoliosis is present, is to look at the shape of the ribs and the difference between the right side and the left side. And this twisting also results in some misshaping of the ribs. So you can see that in cross section, the ribs don't even have the same shape. And that, that uh, is important later on because if we straighten the spine or need to straighten the spine, that rib deformity to some extent may persist. So what's inside this chest? The ribs and the spine contain the chest cavity, build, make up the chest cavity. There's some important things in there. In the chest, we've got the lungs, need those for breathing. We've got the heart, pumps your blood all around. Uh, and in most cases, uh, mild scoliosis has no impact on these things. We can bend our body to the side and our heart doesn't stop pumping and our lungs don't stop breathing. So you can have some, we're made to move a fair bit, but uh, in severe cases, it can affect breathing in the heart. So there are the lungs and the heart inside that chest. And you can imagine as that happens, it could affect those things. How many people are affected by this? In this room, I'm sure it's far more than 3%, but if you go in any other room, out in the, in the general population, about 3% of healthy teens have scoliosis. Now most of these turn out to be mild, fortunately, but still, that's a lot of people, uh, three in a hundred. So uh, one in every school classroom, just about. Mild forms, very common, three in a hundred, males and females affected equally. Uh, but in more severe cases, fortunately, it becomes much less rare, but unfortunately for the girls, uh, much more problematic. So um, girls, for whatever reason, are much more likely to have their curves get worse, whereas uh, boys, not so. But scoliosis in other conditions can be have highly variable rates. So in cerebral palsy, it's very much dependent on the severity of the disorder, neurofibromatosis, congenital forms, the rates are uh, highly variable. So it's really not so easy to, uh, to say how frequently scoliosis is. But, uh, well, I'm going to finish there. Uh, we have lots of details about all these aspects of scoliosis coming. And uh, so we'll move up and uh, Bert will take us, take us on to our next talk.
their scoliosis is primary to their spine. Um, and for that reason, scoliosis is a very broad term um, that can't be just understood with that one uh, diagnosis. Why is this etiology important just in helping you to understand why your child or why you might have scoliosis? It's also important to us because it tells us a lot about how this scoliosis is going to change with time or with growth um, or what kind of other problems we may be encountering because of scoliosis. Um, and then a very common question do for parents is, do I have to worry about my other son or my other daughter and whether they're going to develop scoliosis? And a lot of that is based on really the etiology. Um, there are basically four main categories for scoliosis, but yet this probably isn't completely inclusive. The idiopathic is the most common, and that really means that we don't really know what the cause is. Um, and it's primary, probably primarily a spine problem. But there are patients who have neuromuscular scoliosis, congenital scoliosis, and we'll go through some of these. And they all look a little different, and they all have very different takes as to you know, how this is going to change or how may, it may affect the patient's life in the future. So idiopathic, kind of talking about that one first. Idiopathic means we don't have a cause, okay? We think it's probably genetic. Um, we do kind of break down idiopathic based on when the diagnosis is made. So uh, there's infantile for under the age of four. There are patients who get diagnosed between four and 10, who are juvenile. And then the most common population that we see is the adolescent. So right around puberty, right around growth spurts, uh, we start to see another population. And that's where a lot of, probably you, were picked up by the pediatrician or maybe by the school and so forth. And as I suggested, the cause is unknown, which doesn't intuitively make sense, right? It doesn't make sense that we don't really know the cause. The problem is it's probably genetic. There are probably more than one gene. Uh, we're just, uh, we're, we're learning more about scoliosis, and that's what saying scoliosis straight is about, is helping to support us figuring out how to uh, really delineate some of the diagnosis and treatment. Um, neuromuscular scoliosis, I mentioned, is either a problem with the muscles or the nerves that control the balance, and the spine collapses essentially because of that poor muscle control or uneven uh, muscle tone on the spine, and, then, and just to gravity, the spine that can't always hold itself upright. There are lots of different diagnoses that can lead to neuromuscular scoliosis. Probably the most common that we see are uh, cerebral palsy, uh, spinal muscular atrophy, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, but there are a lot. And even patients within cerebral palsy, um, the, the, there may be differences in the quality or the, the size of their scoliosis as well. Scoliosis in this population also commonly affects the pelvis and what them what we notice in those patients, a lot of these patients are wheelchair bound. They have a difficult time potentially sitting because their scoliosis kind of makes their pelvis on, on the x-ray above there to be kind of oblique, uh, which can make it very difficult for them. Congenital scoliosis is the only scoliosis that we really truly know was existence at birth. So basically that's a scoliosis that's secondary to malformed vertebra in the spine. And there are lots of different kinds of malformed vertebra. Some have a potential to get worse as you grow. And some are pretty static, meaning that you know, we see it, we see the abnormalities, but the spine is relatively straight. And will stay that way as they continue to grow. Syndrome, kind of the last group, is probably the broadest of the um, as I kind of talked about, there are lots of different diagnoses that, lead, uh, that kind of can lead to scoliosis. Um, Marfan syndrome, osteogenetic effect, uh, neurofibromatosis. Um, and when we talk about variable penetrance, what I'm trying to say is that there may be two patients with Marfan syndrome. One has really severe scoliosis, and then the other one doesn't have so severe scoliosis. And so there can be kind of a variability even within the diagnosis that they have in who's going to develop scoliosis what their ultimate prognosis is for us. Uh, and their presentation can be like any of the other three. So just kind of in conclusion, the importance of this, we know it's important for you. You want to know the why. It's really important for us as well. And we are still going through that process trying to discover it. But ultimately, it will hopefully help as we find out the reasons for scoliosis and diagnosis.
Great, thanks, Bert. Now, scoliosis is a genetic condition. Idiopath the idiopathic type is a genetic condition. This diagram is what's called a kinship coefficient. What's really interesting about this room is that those of you with progressive scoliosis are more related to each other than any other people on this planet. And you may have never met, but your genetic makeup is closer to people in this room than outside this room, which is really interesting. And so we know that people with scoliosis, the progressive type, are more related to each other because they share certain genes that can turn the scoliosis on that are not protective of keeping a straight spine. And that's where the research was going for a little while. What we need to have is a handle on, on the genetic condition. This is not a genetic condition like an enzyme deficiency, where we have one gene and with analysis we can turn that off. This is not a condition where the future is going to be gene therapy. We might be able to manipulate some of those genes, but it's not going to be a single gene. It's polygenic. That means multiple genes uh, can affect the condition. And as Bert mentioned, it's variable penetrance. Some of you have the more severe condition, some of you have the milder form. And we don't know what necessarily turns that on. Furthermore, there's environmental emphasis. That means there's things outside your body which can change whether those genes are on or off. Perhaps where you live in the part of the world and what kind of diet you have. But diet may not be as significant uh, of a factor as some people would lead you to believe. And I'm gonna clear up some of those misconceptions. So there was a genetic test on the market and we were very excited about it initially, but when we studied it further, it didn't pan out to be extremely accurate. And unfortunately, we had to go back to the drawing board. And these things like GWAS and SNPs and CRISPR, it's the genetic science is becoming very sophisticated, very cheap, and very quick. And that's where people are sort of putting their, their money these days. And why is it important? We need to find out in the early form of the condition who is going to progress and who is not. So these are two patients with 10 degree curves. One went through x-rays every six months, unnecessary worry, maybe unnecessary bracing, and the other, despite interventions like bracing, still ended up needing surgery. How can we spot who's going to progress and who's not right off the bat is something we're extremely interested in. So here's some common misconceptions and myths about scoliosis. Poor posture and slouching may cause kyphosis. That means I might be hunched over when I'm older, but it will not cause scoliosis or aggravate that condition. Everyone with scoliosis will not become deformed because most of the time the curve doesn't get worse. So you're not going to be subjected to looking very malformed as an adult even with scoliosis. And with current treatments, you'll see later that we can cause pretty spectacular corrections. Backpacks do not contribute to having scoliosis. We did a study in which the incidence of back pain in teenagers was higher, their backpacks were heavy. But a lot of parents have questions on what shoulder I should carry it on and how, how heavy should it be. I'll tell you the quick summary is it shouldn't be more than 20% of your body weight. So put it on a scale. If it's weighing 20 pounds, it's probably too heavy. Uh, there are ways to decrease the weight, obviously. And you should wear it on both shoulders and uh, try to keep it as light as possible. We get a lot of questions about diet and nutrition. I'll tell you, we know vitamin D is important. We know calcium is important. And selenium is another uh, mineral that's very important for bone development. Does anybody know some foods that are high in selenium? The adults in the room might appreciate that beer is high in selenium. <laughs> <laughs> but things like nuts, oysters, fish, certain meats are very high in selenium. So I suggest that you incorporate that into some of your diet. And some of the teenagers probably don't like foods like mushrooms and, and things that are also very high. Swimming does not cause scoliosis. There is a publication um, sort of uh, uh, implicating uh, swimming in cause of scoliosis. Nothing you do for that short period of time over the course of the week is going to aggravate this condition. We actually encourage exercise as a very important part of living with scoliosis because it promotes good core strength, mobility, and fitness. And so we really want to um, uh, propose that. And muscle development and balance can be treated with certain chiropractic maneuvers and exercise. I'll tell you, we're not sure about that. The evidence is lacking. And we have another uh, subject later talking about how to analyze evidence and research. If you Google non-operative scoliosis care, what comes to the top are not evidence-based methods <coughs> like bracing, but some of the things are advertisements for very boutique clinics that, cause, that, that charge a lot of money for therapies that are unproven in science. So I really would ask you to be skeptical and open-minded to what some of those treatments can and can't do. Other misconceptions, scoliosis does not make you fragile. 
You should be able to participate in virtually every sport, whether you have surgery or not. And we're very aggressive about getting our kids back into the things they like to do. We want to make this intervention as painless as possible, and that includes the psychological development of going back to things you like to do after bracing or surgery is over. And you can travel after scoliosis. Don't think that you can't get on a plane or that your life is going to be affected uh, with regard to your hobbies, choice of occupation, or even having a family. You're going to hear later about some good long-term data showing that your ability to have a family after scoliosis surgery is virtually unchanged. So that's about it for misconceptions. We're open for questions later, and we're going to move on to Dr. Michael Bosman. Great. Thank you, Susan. to us from Boston Children's Hospital, and uh, one of the really important aspects of, of scoliosis, of course, is trying to understand what happens if you treat it. So I mean, don't treat it or treat it, and knowing the natural history of what will happen untreated is a big piece of that equation. So uh, Dr. Glassberg will take us through that. Thanks, man. Great. Uh, thank you very much for uh, having me. And, uh, my task today is to talk about the natural history of untreated scoliosis. So, Although many in this room maybe have had surgery or are going to have surgery, the reality is most people who have scoliosis don't end up needing surgery. And so what's going to happen in the long run? So the goals of this task are what's going to happen to you if your curve is small, what if it's medium, and what if it's big. And we'll also touch on if you've been braced, does that mean you get the rules are difficult? So what do we know about untreated curves without getting too scientific? So we know that if you are done growing, small curves generally do not get bigger. But if you have big curves, they generally do. So if you look at this, about 70 to 80% of the time, curves bigger than 60 degrees are going to get bigger. bigger. Now, which curves are going to get bigger? If you have a curve in your thorax, in your chest area, curves bigger than 45 to 50 degrees are likely to get bigger. In the lower lumbar spine, it's more like 40 to 45 degrees. They don't get worse quickly like they do when you're growing. They get worse sort of slowly. So it's a slow lean, about one degree per year. Now, what about people who are treated, who are untreated with scoliosis when they're adults? So if you look at so older people that have had scoliosis for a long time, you look, what is their life expectancy? Or what is their ability to bend forward? What is their ability to have a normal neurologic life? All studies have shown that people with scoliosis are just like people without scoliosis with regards to these sort of big item tickets. We're all breathing. So when we actually talk about curves, we really care about the lung. Right? A lot of our treatment is based on lung treatment. So the biggest concern and why we treat scoliosis is to prevent pulmonary issues in the long term. So who has breathing issues? The reality is you actually don't have pulmonary issues until your curve gets bigger, 70, 80 degrees. That's when you start having a meaningful impact on your lung function. So the curves that are smaller uh, do not. Now this is the, probably one of the biggest misconceptions as far as scoliosis, is will scoliosis cause back pain? And if you look at the long-term studies, again, people who have had scoliosis for a long time, if you have a really big curve, you might have a little bit of an increase in mild back pain. But when you look at back pain that causes disability, severe back pain, that basically it's exactly the same whether you have scoliosis or not. So the problem is, is all of us have back pain. A lot of us have scoliosis, so a lot of us have both, and we like to blame the scoliosis, but in reality, just because we're getting older. Um, what about uh, body image? So obviously this is another concern with scoliosis. How do you feel about your body if you have a scoliosis? Well, if you, again, look at older adults, and you ask question them how they feel, the reality is that kids, people with scoliosis are basically slightly dissatisfied and slightly satisfied, and if you have, don't have scoliosis, you're not that much different. So when you get older, we're all sort of relatively unsatisfied, but it's no different if you have scoliosis. The other question is, I always ask, am asked this, am I going to have a hunchback if I have scoliosis, right? And the reality is no, this is a totally different process. So kyphosis, as Sukin sort of mentioned, is that round of posture. It's usually a different process, it's usually from osteoporosis, and if you have scoliosis, you will not end up with a hunchback. So what about your curve? Um, so if you have a small curve, curve less than you know, 10 to 15 degrees, don't worry about it. And in fact, I tell my parents, don't even put it on your health history forms if you have a 10 degree curve that you have scoliosis. You don't think about this when you're 15 or 16. When you apply for disability or life insurance when you're 30, 35, why not even have it on there? Because it's gonna have no impact on your life. What about medium curve, 20, 30 degree curves? Well, that curve is unlikely to get bigger, and you have no increase in pain, no major issues with your lung, no need for a brace, and basically, maybe you'll see a little something, but not very much. Big curves, so this is where we talk about why you might need something done. So big curves, you're gonna be asymptomatic now, however, it's likely to get bigger, it'll get bigger slowly, and it may cause pain and lung issues later in life when it gets big. 
So why do you need surgery if you have a 45 or 50 degree curve and you're 15 years old and you feel great? Well, the reality is if your curve is 50 degrees at age 15, by the time you're 35 or 40, you may have that 75 or 80 degree curve. And the reality is it's a lot easier to get out of bed in the morning at 15 than it is at 40. And so that means you recover from surgery a lot easier at 15 than you do from 40, and that's why I take care of peas and not adults. <laughs> so uh, what about if you're braced? The reality is there's not much data out there as far as patient of braced, but really if you're braced, the long-term natural history is really no different than untreated scoliosis. So as far as pain, dysfunction, really no difference, and so bracing does not make a big difference. So in summary, small curve, really not a problem. Medium-sized curve, probably not a problem. If you have a big curve, you probably don't have problems now, but the reason you need to think about doing something is because it may give you trouble in the future. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Uh, our next uh, speaker, I got to know 20 years ago-ish, something like that. Um, and Doug Wheeler is uh, one of our patient ambassadors, and uh, Doug reached out to me and recently and said, hey, I, I want to get involved in, uh, in what's going on. And so he's got, uh, he's got a story to tell you that is uh, a little different than the scoliosis story, but you've been hearing a lot about kyphosis, and so he's going to show you about kicking it. Yeah, I, I liked that transition. Dr. Bob Decker and Dr. Shaw also mentioned the, the hunchback. So we were really centered here around scoliosis, but I had kyphosis. And the association for me, and a very long, very long description there, but it's a, it's a wedging of the anterior column of the spine. Uh, Dr. Newton thought that that was associated with a very large growth spurt that I had. I was this tall at well, 6'4 to 11, and when I actually ended up getting fused, I only came out about another inch to where I am now. So I didn't grow a whole lot past when I got fused, but phenomenal outcome. So again, like I was mentioning, uh, the hospital was called just Children's Hospital back then, because this was back in 2000. Caught it again, 11-inch 11, 11 growth spurt from age 11 to 12, so I was, uh, was a little bit tall and gangly when I was <laughs> a lot of basketball references, but uh, you know, as, as a lot might find here, that when you're dealing with some spinal deformities, it's hard to kind of control your body. It took me years to kind of gather that. I think we'll talk about that more later. Um, the hospital recovery was, was trying. It's tough on patients, it's tough on parents, it's tough to see your kids in pain, and it's a, it's a tough process, on especially the patients as well, and it's gonna take a lot of support from both patients and parents to make sure that uh, uh, there's that psychological support that needs to be taking place. Um, home recovery period, at least for me, was a lot longer, and that was another supportive time where I was in a, you know, I was in a hospital bed in my living room for some time, gathering, you know, my ability to walk again and kind of do my own in-home recovery, and that was a lot of support for my parents at that time. And that's going to be especially more important with this group as well. Um, I don't know my picture didn't come through, but I think that uh, the post-op care is, is very much important. You need to go with whatever your, your surgeon or uh, after, if you're doing a procedure or not doing a procedure, you know, definitely abide by what your surgeon's telling you because the, they know what's best to do. Don't go start to let them be things that you know what's best <laughs> I've found that my success in getting a better handle on my body and, of course, not having troubles as the years have gone on is, is physical fitness. So uh, I've stayed up with it, I think, a year after my surgery. I was a walk-on varsity at Claremont High School here in San Diego. I've moved around since then. But, uh, I think with that stretching, becomes a huge portion. Every single every single day I wake up, I'm doing at least a five, 10 minute stretch because you have a lot of compensatory muscles that are, that are taping and uh, taking over the load for others that might be weaker. And your, your, of course your posture is natural. I've fused at 10 levels, so it's not quite natural. So it's gonna take a lot of adjustment in your daily life, whether or not it's, it's an activity that you used to be able to do normally, if you're going, you're having a brace on, you've had a surgery afterwards, you might have to make some adjustments. And that's going to take some time to kind of gather your body and feel what that's, what that's going to feel like in those new body motions. Um, <clears throat> my personal experience was, again, about two weeks in the hospital and then four, four months in a hospital bed in my living room. Uh, again, it was a bigger case and technological advancements are much different now. The recovery is much shorter and amazing things can be done. Uh, but again, 
this was kind of a after the fact my physical involvement. So I was uh, walk on varsity about a year after the surgery. Uh, I started kickboxing about two years after the surgery here locally in San Diego. Uh, a couple years after I was playing football for Mesa College. There was a very big, very big line there, so got mashed up a little bit there. Uh, when I went off to college in San Jose, I joined the San Jose, box, San Jose State boxing team. Uh, started training at the same time at a very predominant kickboxing gym up in the Bay Area, American Kickboxing Academy. A lot of UFC fighters come out of there. Uh, a couple of years later, I was a personal trainer at a couple different gyms, very different, various different gyms, and actually currently I'm training for I hope they love to fight for the next year. Uh, and funny enough, I jumped around a lot of different career fields before finding what I'm in now, but I'm in the medical device implant world where I'm working with spine implants. So I represent some smaller companies that uh, aren't, aren't supporting this event. They, they don't work really in the performing space. I don't even work with pediatrics too often, but a lot of the adult generation. But it's, again, a small world that I end up in this, in this industry. Uh, there's a lot of different reasons why people get in different career fields. But uh, again, for me, it was getting to work with surgeons that are working in the spine world. And if there was any way that I could give a little bit of help to outcomes on other patients, that's what else could you possibly do? Uh, I found this funny picture on images. I just want to say, Dr. Yudhi, you changed my life. I found this video along, hopefully it'll play. I don't have to wear the technological investments, but. Go back one? Yeah. Talking about staying active.
I, do you want to go through these first? Sure. Okay. Um, okay. Let me, let me right click, click it. Okay. Okay, the treatments uh, that we did pros and cons. So this is our daughter Marissa um, pre-op. And uh, what, we, what we ended up doing is uh, spine core bracing, which was not recommended by Dr. Newton or the hospital. Because uh, when we heard the word surgery and spinal fusion, we got very, very nervous and we looked for alternative measures. And we did it for a few years actually with both of our kids, Eric and Marissa. And uh, bottom line is I don't think it worked. Uh, it was unfortunate because we put a lot of time and effort into it. But Marissa's uh, curve accelerated in rotation to about 104 degrees. So. Uh, she, ended up, she ended up doing a nine and a half hour surgery four years ago, uh, but has done phenomenal since then. I mean, just unbelievable. Um, Do you want to say anything in there? Okay, let's click. <laughs> <laughs> what to bring to the hospital first? Do you want to talk about that? Okay. So, um, before surgery, you're obviously, your mind is going like crazy, wondering about how best to be prepared. I would um, stress to listen to the staff, the pros, the people that have been there. They, they will give you a ton of information and guidance and support. Um, for Marissi, she is a ukulele player and that gave her a lot of comfort as she was recovering so we did we took the ukulele um, the pillow is a fabulous device to use after surgery just to help comfort from the wounds um, and it, it gives a little bit of a, an emotional um, item to to snuggle with. Um, and then obviously just your um, basic toiletries, some big loose clothing to go home in, that sort of thing. Um, pack light. You're going to be in bed and um, just looking forward to the days to go home. Um, this is interesting actually, the questions. So, you know, I'm, I think a lot of people in today's world, you can go on the internet and Google a bunch of things and start talking and getting second and third and fifth opinions. One of my dear friends is uh, the guy who created LASIK eye surgery. And uh, I remember meeting with him at the house and I said, I've written out, I think, about 75 questions I'm going to ask Dr. Newton. And he looked at me and he said, why? The guy's been through medical school, he's done his in boards, he's, you know, he's been doing this for 20 years. When you're trying to become the surgeon, you're not going to make any difference in the room. <laughs> he said, ask him three questions. And I said, okay, I'll pare it down to three questions. He said, do you trust him? Do you trust the hospital? And I said, yeah, of course, implicitly. See, so don't waste his time. He said, okay. And I think, it, I think it's, <laughs> you know, I think it's interesting because we've met a lot of people. <laughs> We've met a lot of people, and they really dive into the details. And uh, again, you know, it's it's good to have knowledge for sure, and to know your options. But you're not going to be the surgeon. You're not going to make a difference in the room. Um, I think before questions before surgery, you know, you want to kind of know what to bring. What Chris was alluding to, um, I think after. Is, is pretty critical because uh, for us it was a learning experience. Uh, you know, our daughter at the time was 14 years old. Uh, she comes out of a very complex nine and a half hour surgery, three inches taller. Um, she'd never had the experience of having a couple glasses of wine and having what's the feeling of a buzz. And you're on heavy, main, heavy pain meds. Um, and then as a 14-year-old young lady, you know, you're experiencing your menstrual cycle. So you take all three of those things and, it, 
and the emotional roller coaster, and it's it's hard to deal with that. So I would say that you know it's, that's I don't know if that's really a question, but that's more of an experience that we had, and, and how you kind of deal with that is uh, a little bit individualized. Um, do you want to add anything? I just remember when Marissi first came home, uh, I felt like I had a newborn at home again. Um, we had to adjust the, the bed so she could get in and out. We had to rotate her. We had to rotate her. Um, we had to be on her meds within certain you know time slots. And she at the time could not swallow pills. So we were crushing pills, mixing it in whatever I could mix it in which to this day she still won't eat. <laughs> Applesauce, yogurt, ice cream, anything that I could get her to take those pills with. Um, so that was a constant cycle, um, but it, it happens in, in such a fast pace that that's a couple days and then you're, you're done and she's rolling out of bed on her own. And she's walking up and down the stairs as you're cringing, going, oh my god, you can't do that. But she, these kids are really strong. And um, the, the best thing you can do, I think, at that point is just continue to give them uh, positive affirmations and, um, and continue to support even when they're up and down on that emotional roller coaster of healing. One day they're not feeling great. They're upset with how they're feeling. They're, they're missing out on maybe some activities that their other friends are doing and they want to be back at it already. They're impatient. But the time really does, it does go pretty darn fast. And I think just looking ahead at the slides, I think we kind of just covered important. Maybe, yeah. is there any questions that we could ask? Please don't be shy because, yeah. We we didn't. We had a bedroom downstairs uh, that we anticipated using, um, and they have the kids up and walking at the hospital. And part of the um, post op discharge is to be able to walk up and down the stairs. So Marissa did go upstairs to sleep. Um, Depending on, I guess, how how big your child is, if you have to rotate them on occasion to change their positioning and that sort of thing, um, they'll show you how to do that at the hospital with blankets and that sort of thing. We did go and get an adjustable bed, though, um, that would raise up and down a little bit. Um, instead of propping so many pillows behind her back and that sort of thing. So that, that did help out a lot. I think we've got, we've got some time uh, into the program to, to kind of do this kind of stuff. So uh, I think we'll, let, let, let's keep going. And we're, we've got a bunch of time uh, booked in to be able to have question and answer. So we'll, we'll get back to these things uh, quick, okay? That, that, those are great questions. And, uh, thank you guys. Sure. Thank you. San Diego is my second home. Uh, I was a med student here and then lucky enough to be a fellow more years ago than I'd like to admit. Uh, but uh, I started my fellowship not interested in pediatric spine at all, although I would not have admitted that on in my interview. Uh, <laughs> after working with uh, Dr. Newton and Dr. Yaze, uh, my perspective totally changed and it's now my main focus and, and something that I really love to do on all parts of it, not just the surgical part. So I'll try to give kind of the clinician perspective of how to be your uh, child's best advocate. Uh, I think that in general, parenting is hard. Being a parent is really hard on the best of days. And when you throw in a new diagnosis, uh, it can be extremely overwhelming. Uh, and you know, the title of this event is Power Over Scoliosis. And I think knowledge is power, but knowledge is also overwhelming. Uh, and so hopefully I can kind of help guide you in, in how to navigate that. Uh, I think that, you know, 
many of you uh, should be, or all of you should be commended for taking the first step of how to be the best advocate, and that's gaining information and being here. I think it's very common for families to want to what I call ostrich it when they get this diagnosis. So I think for many of you, you're going along your normal preteen teen life, dealing with sort of normal things, and all of a sudden you go to your annual check, and the doctor kind of you know lifts an eyebrow, and all of a sudden you're being referred for an X-ray, or maybe you went bathing suit shopping, and something looks kind of off, and otherwise feel fine, and you get this X-ray, and all of a sudden people are talking about curves and progression, and bracing, and surgery, and it can be extremely overwhelming, and I know many families who disappear for a while and eventually show back up. So I think the first step to being a good advocate is what you're doing already, which is gathering information. So just, I think, some general things to keep in mind before I get into some more specific websites is trying to strike a balance between trusting that your doctors and staff really have you and your child's best interests at heart. You know, take a Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm, and I, you know, I think we're here and we do our work because we really want to do what's best for patients and we're doing our best to take care of you and to, to deliver the best care that we know how. But at the same time, I think as a parent and as a person, you don't want to have total blind faith in the process. Certainly, you know, we, you come to us for a reason, you come to us for our opinion. One of my favorite pictures, which I didn't include, is that your Google search does not trump my medical degree. Um, I think that that's, you know, a little bit um, harsh, but, but true. I mean, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there, and our job and our experience is to help you distill that and help answer questions that that may uh, bring, etc. So try to find that balance between trusting us, but at the same time having an active discussion, being empowered, answering and asking questions and having them answer, and not necessarily feeling rushed or bullied or that sort of thing. I think another general principle is if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. So I think all of us here today, in an ideal world, our patients would have straight, unfused spines for the rest of their lives. That is not a right reality, unfortunately. Um, just like I like to be taller and thinner, and you know, there are certain things that you want to be true, but just aren't necessarily that way. So, if you find a website where they have great correction and everybody does great, and there are no complications, it's way better than anything else you've heard. Oh, and by the way, it costs this much money. That's probably not a good site. And Dr. Shaw uh, showed a bunch of those. So, I think again, being a healthy skeptic. But still keeping an open mind, we call it idiopathic for a reason. Uh, I have a partner who says, well, anyway, not a nice thing, but anyway. Um, <laughs> idiopathic basically means, you know, we don't know everything, but we have to justify our medical school debt and all the years of training that we went through, so we need a fancy Greek word. Um, but we keep an open mind because we don't know everything. There may be that next treatment that, you know, a few mavericks discover, and then it is researched and catches on. So. Trying to find that balance. Um, fact versus fiction, as I uh, discussed, there's a lot of information on the internet about scoliosis, and not all of it is that uh, accurate uh, or reliable. Uh, as I mentioned, maintain the healthy skepticism. And I think somebody's going to get into this later about how to interpret research and studies, but um, keep in mind to like not just read the tagline or the summary or what the person wants you to take home, but really look into the details. So for example, for some non-operative treatments for scoliosis, they'll talk about a percent of patients who had curve improvement or curve correction. But then when you, and you think, oh, that sounds great, you know, the spine core brace will improve the curve or, or whatever it may be. But then when you drill down the details, the average curve, curve improvement was maybe three degrees. And we know that when you measure two x-rays on two separate occasions by the same person, that angle is going to vary by up to five degrees. So all of a sudden that three degree improvement, well really that isn't an improvement. So again, just trying to be smart, be sa as savvy as you can be, use us as your, as your partners, as your resources, that's what we're here for, um, and just do your best. So now focusing on a few of my favorite website resources that I like to send patients to. And the SRS and the Scoliosis Research Society have been around for a really long time, since the mid-60s devoted to scoliosis, basically from the cradle to the grave, uh, which is nice to get that longitudinal perspective. It's also a very international organization, so it's not just you know the U.S. perspective, but really experience around the world. Uh, they have a very uh, nice, robust patient and family section. And specifically, uh, I like that they break it down for um, parents, 
for adolescents and their formal relations. So there is sort of a, um, a variety of places you can go depending on who you are. So I like that one. And uh, then it's been said to Strait, obviously, this organization here. One of the reasons why I like uh, the Skating Sending Scoliosis website is that it's very patient focused. Um, so it's a little bit less sort of the researchers standing up here talking to patients, but I think a more collaborative um, effort. Um, they have their education. They frequently ask questions. They have videos, of, I think YouTube videos of previous uh, versions of this meeting here. Uh, so if you're not a reader but a watcher, uh, then that um, media might work well for you. And then finally, one of my personal favorites, just because you know, this happens usually, especially for adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, and this happening to kids who are in their preteen and teen years, starting to take more responsibility in general for things. And so, especially when it comes to brace wearing, you know, I can't wear the brace for you, your parent can't wear the, wear the brace for you, you are the one who's going to school and living your life with the brace. And so it's really nice to have a resource of other peers who are going through the same thing. So Kirby Girls for Scoliosis, don't Google just curvy girls because you find like not <laughs> right pictures. I made that mistake once. Uh, so curvy girls for scoliosis is a peer-run international uh, group where in various areas there are leads, um, usually run by girls but boys as well, talking about bracing, the practical aspects like what tank top can you wear, and really kind of the nitty gritty that we as clinicians we can talk to you about like well you have this percent risk of progression or not, if you wear a brace this many hours, but then when it comes down to like, oh, where do I put my brace during PE, it doesn't fit in my locker, that's a harder question for us to answer, but your friends at Curvy Girls may be able to answer it. So, stop there, and thank you for your attention. Good. Well, I think we're uh, on schedule and slated for a uh, hospital there in L.A. And he's going to talk about diagnostic testing and evaluation techniques. You're already making fun of me. I, I haven't even started talking. <laughs> Dr. Clements. Uh, anyways, thank you all for coming. I, you know, just to summarize what I learned in the, in the morning, apparently, uh, the spine surgery makes you taller, so Dr. Newton, if you have a little time on your schedule, I, I, I could totally use a couple inches, you know. Uh, so uh, we're going to just talk a little bit about diagnostic testing and evaluative techniques. Um, some of the stuff is information that you can read it, and I'll just try to summarize what is going on. So we, we heard all about idiopathic, you know, what causes scoliosis. I, we're not 100% sure, but when we do surgery, it's really, uh, I'm sorry, when we see patients, it's really, really important for us to know whether or not it's any of these other things uh, that would change our plan uh, for management. And so if it's, if it's something else, if it's not idiopathic, we have to rule out all these other things. We have to look at things like a connective tissue disorder like Marfan's disease, or possibly something going on in the spinal cord, and sometimes we need special tests to be able to um, find these things out. Um, so when I see a kid, I, I have this thing that's called the palm sign. All right. So when you say, when a child says, "I'm having back pain," if they, I, I say, "Where are you having back pain?" If they use their palm and they just say, "I'm having this kind of back pain," the palm sign. I'm not that worried. But if a kid says, "I have back pain," and it is right here, it's always right here. It happens all the time. That's when I get a little bit more worried. And that's when I'm really considering maybe I have to do uh, some other kind of test to make sure that this isn't just this idiopathic type scoliosis. Maybe it's something else. Uh, pain at night, pain that wakes me up from night at, at night. Uh, I, I heard earlier today that uh, it's easier to wake up as you get older, or it's easier to wake up. I, I'm not sure. It, but I can tell you anything, I'm a really deep sleeper, and, and if something's waking me up from sleep, that's pain, then I'm really worried, and maybe I want to get another study about that. Um, and also pain, like if you told me, yeah, I have pain when I run, you know, a marathon. Okay, well, that's normal, you know, but if you say, I have pain when I'm just sitting in a chair, that makes me worry as well. 
So uh, we all know we'll get x-rays and we'll look at x-rays in multiple different uh, planes. We'll look at it from the front, we'll look at it from the side, and we'll look at some bending x-rays to see how flexible curves are. And then, you know, some of us have access to this kind of machine. Uh, it's an EOS machine. EOS is the god of the sun, I think. And uh, these are really high definition images. They're uh, really low radiation dose. So you get like this HD image uh, with low radiation dose, and you do it standing up. So you see what kids look like um, as they would, they would look as if they were standing. And it takes both the front and the side images at the same time. Uh, so it's really the best of both worlds. Um, when should we get an MRI? We really should be getting an MRI when we're worried about some of those other things. I don't think every kid that's, that has a scoliosis uh, needs an MRI. Really, we're looking at some of these things that, um, that uh, we see on an exam that could really steer us towards, maybe this is something non-idiopathic. And so I'll just summarize a little literature. Medical literature is a little dry, so I will just try to do the Cliff's Notes version for you. So these are some children's MRI machines. Uh, I mean, these are really nice. We don't have this at our hospital, but I saw these pictures, and I'm like, man, I really want one of these. Um, but uh, anyways, this is one of those studies that I was talking about. Um, basically, they looked at a lot of kids uh, who had presumed uh, scoliosis. Um, they 21% of those kids had an MRI for whatever reason, but really the most valuable uh, indicator for uh, you know an abnormal finding was hyperkyphosis. So a kid with kyphosis, that's not really that that tells me that maybe something else besides uh, you know an idiopathic cause could be driving this. So. Um, and you can see there's a lot of indications for MRI, but really the ones that I, the one I worry about the most is this kyphosis. But maybe the, uh, an atypical curve pattern. A curve, instead of going to the right in the chest, goes to the left. That makes me worry a little bit more. Um, and so this is an example of a kid who has an, an idiopathic kind of scoliosis. Uh, MRI was normal. Um, this is what most of the curves that we see look like. But sometimes you see this curve where you have this scoliosis, but then you have a kyphosis. You really, you don't usually see kyphosis along scoliosis. And this kid had an abnormality that was seen on MRI. So this is one of the things that we look for. You know, on that MRI, we saw this thing called the syrinx. It's a little fluid collection inside the spinal cord. Um, the body has plumbing everywhere. And the syrinx, to me, is a plumbing problem inside the spinal cord. And that's what was causing this kid's scoliosis. Um, and what about this? This is another study, big study, and same thing. They looked at this, uh, looked at the kids who got the MRIs. What what did they know? Uh, what was the big risk factor for an abnormal uh, MRI was thoracic hyperkyphosis, uh, and then if the curve started a little bit earlier, so in those kids, we might consider getting an MRI as well. And this is kind of the summary of that talk, uh, of that paper, excuse me, about thoracic hyperkyphosis and juvenile idiopathic scoliosis, and all these other ones really didn't seem to make a difference. Um, and then what about CT scan? So, or CAT scan, CT scan. Um, really, we try to limit using a CT scan because as well as an MRI, which is magnetic re resonance and has no radiation, a CT scan does have some degree of radiation. And so if I'm going to use it, I really want to know, have a reason for using it. So for me, it's for a very severe scoliosis or for a non idiopathic scoliosis, especially congenital scoliosis, where I'm not really sure about my anatomy. <coughs> and this is a good example of a kid look, this is the x-ray that I saw. I don't really know what's going on with this kid without a CT scan. And so thankfully, I got a CT scan and gave me a little better idea of what's going on and how we're going to fix this. Um, so some, you know, one or two hours later of surgery, um, and, uh, we finished it. This was actually, I think, seven and a half hours. So seven and a half hours of surgery later, we did this and we got the, got our lot straighter. But without that CT scan, I don't know if I could have done this operation safely. Um, and so sometimes the use of a uh, device a CT scan in the operating room, this can also help you. Uh, some surgeons really, really uh, love this device. Um, but I, I would say that this is a, a surgeon preference kind of thing. Um, and what about pulmonary function tests? These are things that we get in the clinic. What really, we, uh, Dr. Glotzbecker talked about, we're worried about um, what happens to lungs in kids who get scoliosis and the scoliosis gets worse. And so we really want to measure uh, what's happening with the lungs to make sure what we're doing is helping kids. Um, 
And so this is, you know, what a kid looks like uh, doing this uh, breathing into this machine. And then this, these are the kind of games that we have on our PFT machine. You know, you blow out the candles, uh, you blow out a cake, or you, uh, you know, bowl over here. What would, I think, really make this successful, I think, is if we turn this into Fortnite, right? Like somehow if we turn this into Fortnite or Minecraft or something, right? Uh, we're not quite there yet. Uh, we will keep working on it. Um, but basically, uh, multiple studies have been done, uh, but basically showing that um, doing surgery on kids really uh, definitely doesn't make your pulmonary function test worse, and in a lot of cases will improve your pulmonary function. But really, which kids are the ones that get the improvement? Those are the kids who are a little bit restricted before. So, you know, just like I was kidding earlier about if you get surgery, if I got surgery, I'd be a couple inches taller. Uh, I think everyone would sign up for that. But it, really, the kids who are really the most restrictive, uh, you know, they were having a problem with their lungs. When you straighten them out, their lungs tend to get better. If your lungs are already doing pretty well, then um, surgery is not going to make you breathe, turn into Michael Phelps. Um, and so, thank you very much. Uh, this is our new the front seat. And sometimes when I walk into a room, especially with adolescents, I'll sit down and say, okay, uh, parents, I promise you won't leave until your questions are all answered, but I'm here working for you. I may be an expert in scoliosis, but it's your body. Nobody's going to do anything to your body without your consent and understanding. And I say, you might want to take it easy on your parents right now, because this whole scoliosis thing maybe a little bit more stressful on them than it is for you. And with the parents, one of the things you should think about is are you going to get your questions answered after surgery? Uh, how much interaction do you feel you have with the surgeon and with the surgeon's team? Is there a nurse? Is there a PA? Are you going to get people's cell phone numbers? Are you going to feel you always have someone to talk to? And the other thing is just because you're there at that moment, and you should come with written questions and we'll go over that, you know, how are you going to get questions answered right after the visit? Because if you're like my wife and I, by the time we hit the car, we have some different questions and we've heard something differently. So let's get a little bit practical now. Um, so one thing you want to do is if you've had any studies done, show up with the CD and the report in your hands. Because if you say, if the center says, oh, we'll send them, about 50% of the time it doesn't arrive, that kind of slows it up. And if your surgeon can't look at that study right in front of you, it's not as good of a visit as it could have been. And if the patient's having back pain, think about your back pain ahead of time. How bad is it on a scale of 1 to 10? Does it run down the legs? Does it wake you up in the middle of the night? Do you pee in your pants slop accident? That's not just a sign of middle age. It could be a problem with the spine. It could be an indication for an MRI. And think about what you want out of the office visit. Do you want to get out of pain? Do you want to brace? Do you want to be told everything's OK? Can you go back to sports? Think about writing those questions down ahead of time because you're less likely to forget to ask. And one of the questions is, does the facility you're going to have some type of imaging <coughs> system with less radiation? It's about a $600,000 investment for the medical center, but it could be up to 98% less radiation, which is the equivalent of just being alive for five days. That's one of the things you probably want to look at you know, before you go to a medical center. And a few people have kind of poked fun at this. And many people now show up and they already have the diagnosis made for the internet. They're only there to see us you know, for a second opinion to confirm that the internet diagnosis is right. But be careful. That, you know, of course we know the internet isn't always true. And people tend to just put positive results out there. Somehow when things don't work out so well, they're not as eager to share that publicly. And other people have said, if things seem too good to be true, it probably is. If you could just put suction cups on your spine and make your spine straight, none of us would be in this room. We'd all be talking about suction cups. And ask the doctor, what type of scoliosis does my child have? There's many different types that respond differently to treatment. And the big question is, what happens if there's no treatment? So in medical school, we call this natural history. If we don't get involved, just what goes on? Does it get worse? Does it get better? What is it going to affect? And when we look at treatment, we want to weigh not just the risks versus the benefits, but also the resources. If somebody's told they have to go to physical therapy every day for an hour and it costs $100,000, that's a lot of resources. So the missed opportunity costs doing one thing when your child could be doing something else, like sports or sleeping or studying. And what about long-term results? Now, this sounds obvious, but if a 
treatment is new, then there's no long-term results. And many new treatments sound fantastic at first, only because you don't know that the long-term results didn't work out. Now, sometimes there are groundbreaking treatments which are new and amazing, they change things, but not all new treatments end up being good in the long run. And one thing to ask is, what's the volume of this particular type of surgery at your medical center? It's been shown in cardiac surgery and most types of surgeries that if a lot of surgery is done in one medical center, the complication rate tends to be lower. And look around the waiting room. If there's a bunch of old people with low back pain or disability, you know, is that the person who's really doing a lot of scoliosis surgery in young people? You know, don't hesitate to ask to talk to other people. And one of the things that's kind of faked me out in the visit is this girl came in and she wanted surgery. And the mother called me up the next day and said, you know, my daughter told me she kind of stood funny because she wanted surgery. We took another x-ray and all of a sudden the spine was a lot better and she didn't need surgery. So one of the things you want to tell the girls is don't intentionally try to stand to the side, you know, stand up straight. And then one stands how a therapist tells them or not, the degrees can often change by up to 10 degrees. And if your child is particularly into any type of activities, ask to talk to other patients who have done those activities. You know, we have many dancers who are back to dance in two months and can do it for a lifetime, you know, depending on the type of fusion. Fusion doesn't mean you have to stop dancing or you have to stop doing other things. Thank you. But I'd like to thank you. Our, uh, our next uh, session is a uh, is part where we get into the question and answers time. So I'd like uh, the, some of our surgeons to come up. Uh, you guys, A. Clemens, Cho, and Skaggs. Uh, if you would, uh, we'll pull some chairs up in front. And this is an opportunity for you folks to ask any questions that you might have. Of this, uh, people say, you know, what, what, when can I go back to my sports? What, what do uh, each of you guys, how do each of you guys handle the return to activity question? I personally say you can go back to sports whenever you feel like it. Sometimes my PA nurse cringes and says, maybe wait three months. Um, my rate of rod breakage is one in 10 years. My rate of screw breakage is one in 1,000, allowing people to go back to sports whenever they want to, with the small exception of if someone has a weak bone or there's not good fixation at the time of surgery. Maybe pass the mic to everybody else, please. Yeah, so I, I'm a little bit more conservative. I would say, uh, you know, I try to uh, get kids back to school, actually. That's really the most important thing to me. I think when kids get back to school and when they get back to normal life, they actually start to feel better faster. So I try to get kids back to school between two and three weeks after surgery. Um, as far as sports, I usually say wait, wait three months. I'll have kids, I have kids that break that rule and they're fine though. You know, I think it's, it's interesting, it's an evolving question. So if you asked uh, 10 years ago what we did and what we're doing now, I, I would suspect that every surgeon in this room would be very different. Um, you know, 10 years ago it was a year. And now I, you know, am making that transition that I start letting them do activities at six weeks, uh, depending on the activity. And I think that there's going to be a little bit of variability among surgeons and comfort. And there's definitely variability on parents. Uh, but the reality is, is that, that that question is evolved and it's because we've got better understanding and I think we're, we're doing it quicker than where we were before. So for me, what makes a difference is, is it a contact sport or not? If it's not a contact sport, I encourage kids to get back to it as quickly as they feel ready. So for instance, swimming or running or shooting basketball or hitting baseball, go back whenever you feel you're ready for it. However, if it's a contact sport where you're going to get knocked around, I usually recommend waiting about six months before you try that uh, with the thought that after that, your fusion and your operation should be healed enough they can absorb those blows maybe on the field. Very good. Are you guys all comfortable? Oh, yeah, please. I have a question with sports also. Is there any sports activity that you do not recommend after a spine surgery? I'm thinking about golf. Golf? I was thinking about bungee jumping, but uh, <laughs> golf. Everybody, anybody uh, anti-golf? Golf is good. Golf is good. <laughs> I'm not, but golf is. Uh, how about uh, other collision sports? Everybody still okay with football? Uh, look at them. They're all lying. Uh, they're not super excited, but they're not going to say no. David, you're going to say yes? I let them, but I think there is a risk. 
Um, I one time polled a room of about 500 surgeons, have you ever seen a catastrophic spine injury after something like football? Nobody has seen it. It's not reported, but we all do worry about it a little bit. It's, uh, it's funny as, uh, you know, you bring up the bungee cord jumping. So that, one of the common things is, oh, you can go back to bungee cord jumping, parachuting. It's one of those things where I don't think I'm going to do it, so I don't think other people are going to do it. Uh, and then, yeah, exactly. I saw your picture. Uh, and then uh, it was about four days later that I got a, uh, uh, a kind of image of one of my patients uh, bungee cord jumping. So the reality is, is uh, patients can do a lot, but it's going to be, it's going to be to their comfort. It's going to be to parents' comfort. Um, and everybody's gonna be a little bit different, so. And I, so I know I don't look like it, but I was a football player in race one. I have had the experience of getting hit by three people at the same time and breaking my tibia. So um, if, if that's your spine, that makes me worry. If you have a short fusion, I'm, you know, I'm less worried about that. But if you have a really long fusion, I, I think that your your spine is a little bit maybe uh, it, there's a longer longer lever arm for bad things to happen. Doug, you got a long spine, a long lever arm, and you're getting kicked around a little bit. What I do you think? Apart, yeah. <laughs> you're okay? Maybe in future years, but I'm stubborn. Yeah, good. He's, he looks like he's pretty fit. I'm not going to mess with him. Uh, he seems like it's working out pretty well. Good. There's a question over here. Oh, good. So I actually have a question for Dr. Shah. Um, if a patient already has some sequencing for something else like an associated neurological condition, are enough candidate genes identified for scoliosis to make it worth going back and reanalyzing with certain keywords for scoliosis instead? Oh, I was over there. Um, you know, a five-minute uh, time isn't long enough to go through everything. I think the, this field is changing so rapidly. Well, we used to rely on twin studies, then there was GWAS. Uh, because it's going to probably turn out to be multiple genes, it's going to be difficult to do gene therapy for this condition. But um, we have, uh, as many of uh, the other faculties and hospitals, have a biobank. And storing some of these samples for eventual study is our hope that maybe something will come down the road. So um, because sequencing is getting so cheap and so easy to do, uh, if you have the means to do it, that's great. But um, it's, a, it's a bit like storing your, uh, your uh, placental blood. You know? uh, we don't know what uh, the effect of that's going to be in the future, but it's sure nice if you had done it when you had the opportunity to do it. we got one more question over here, please. I have a very basic question that I realize I never looked up before. Why is a right curvature normal as opposed to left? Ugh. If we knew that, we would have the answers to idiopathic scoliosis, I think. You guys have uh, you got any little wisdom? They're all just baffled. I'm sorry. It's just one of those. Okay, go ahead. So can give us the answer. We've been waiting for it. The native, uh, the native erect human spine is already rotating three degrees to accommodate the heart. So with such a fine balance, it's going to tip to that side much more frequently as well. See, we can come up with something to tell you. <laughs> I got one over here. Um, how common are like tension headaches and migraines for patients with scoliosis and also how common is like anxiety and depression? Is that connected to people with scoliosis as well? Great question. You guys have any anything any evidence that it's any different than the, than the regular population? I don't think we think I don't think there's a connection. I don't think they're they're jumping on it like they think there's a connection. I Just think anxiety and depression sometimes build on a pain when you talk about pain. So certainly if there's pain involved, we got a whole different uh, we've changed the cycle of all sorts of things for sure. Do you have to agree with that? <laughs> my my daughter was diagnosed with scoliosis and she has her first cousin with kyphosis and I was wondering um, are there any genetic connections to that? Are they do they have any similarities that they're completely different conditions? Guys? Different. Different? 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 Sukin, I'll let you weigh in since you got well, the genes. I'll, I'll ask you guys. Don't you have families in which both conditions were expressed? I do. Yep. 
But are these, you know, again, how do you put it together? One came from that, one came from, um, I don't know. I mean, I just don't know. Yes, please. So, uh, are there, um, you know, are there any genetic tests that you guys are doing regularly to kind of um, help pre-diagnose you know, diagnose it early? Uh, I'll take it, no. Uh, we, we did have a screening test that was uh, attempted that uh, Dr. Shaw suggested that really hasn't panned out. And where we go from here, uh, we still got a lot of work to do. It, it's not, it's not going to be anything as simple as what was attempted previously, which was just kind of a SNP analysis that just wasn't enough. So we're going to have to really dig deep. It's probably going to get into epigenetics as well as uh, all the other things that are going on. So it's, it's a tough one. In the families that you see um, different generations showing up with scoliosis, do you see a progression in severity in the next generation? Well, that's a great question. Uh, guys, do you think it gets worse with each generation or not? I see it both ways. Uh, and I would say that the fact that you have one, you know, uh, a mother who has had surgery doesn't mean her daughter is going to have surgery. I do think that there may be, though, boys who have scoliosis who have daughters with scoliosis are, are a little, I think the boys have a bigger dose of the stuff that gives you scoliosis and that they may be able to pass that. I don't know if that's exactly been proven, but I have a little bit of a sense of that. Did? So one in a thousand is your average risk of scoliosis. If a mother has scoliosis, her daughter's risk is one in a hundred. That's one way to look at it. Here. Hi, uh, my daughter is going to have a, a pretty uh, long fusion here coming up, and I don't hear much about what she can expect in her older years. Like, what do you have you, you know? Yeah, so uh, you want to know what it's going to be like 50 years from now, Father. And we need 50 years of long-term follow-up data to report that to you. And the surgery that was done 50 years ago is nothing like the surgery that was done today. That's part of the challenge. But the data that we do have on, on the long term is, it depends on how much of the spine is being fused and what the shape of the spine is, particularly in the side profile as to how it turns out long term. Is that fair? You guys have, uh, any, David, you got uh, some adults in your practice, anything additional to add? So what I see is whenever patients get to be in their 50s or 60s after they've had uh, spinal fusion, the part of their spine that was infused starts to wear out maybe a little sooner than other people. Uh, and that, while everybody in their 50s and 60s has back pain, if it wears out a little bit more, you might start to get some pinching of the nerves caused by that. So probably there's a good, fair chance you might have more uh, problems with your back when you're older than someone who never had surgery. But it's not guaranteed and it's not absolute. And as Peter mentioned, the techniques we're using now are preserving more and more of that lower back so that it has more of a chance it's going to be normal when you get older. So I think the patients who are operating on 20, 30 years from now, well, ago, are going to have problems. Maybe our patients won't, and we hope that's the case. Doug's 18 years out, just for reference, right? Close? Something yeah. like that? Coming up on 19. Coming up on 19. There you go. Um, I think we're, let's uh, move on. Thank this panel for me, please. And, uh, we're going to actually bring our, uh, our patient panel up, and the first one uh, is Doug Wheeler. Uh, Emma, Marissa, Courtney, uh, Rich, we're letting you up again as well. And uh, Heidi, you can come up with, up with Courtney. And David's getting the mic. This uh, session is going to be sort of this, what you just saw, except they're going to be experts from uh, a different in a different way. These are all experts about what it's like to go through getting a scoliosis diagnosis and having surgery. These are some of our uh, famous ambassadors, and they're going to share their experience. And actually, what I'd a ask them to do was give us their best advice about whether it's coping with their diagnosis or cho choosing a surgeon or support, but each one of them to give us a piece of advice, what they learned going through this experience. So we'll start out with uh, Emma, since you're on the end. That's Emma. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, so my name is Emma. Um, I had a, a spinal fusion about three years ago uh, with Dr. Yaze, and um, I think the biggest thing that helped me go through scoliosis 
was that my family, they never made me feel like I was any different. They made it never made it seem like a big deal. And I think the, it's, it's often even harder for parents because they feel like they may not be able to do anything. They feel like there's no way that they can help because they're not, they, they're not personally going through it. But um, the way my parents and my brother, they never, they never seemed too worried. And even when I found out that I was gonna get surgery, um, my parents were always like, they maintained their like calm the whole time. And that always made me feel like it was not, not too big of a deal. And I was always just, I felt like, I never felt different or like nervous about the surgery, going into the surgery. Um, the day of, my, even my mom, she was a little nervous. I was like, it's okay, don't worry. <laughs> so the, it, definitely parents and family can do something. And I think it's just not to make it seem too big of a deal, even though it, it definitely is a big thing. It, the, my parents just making, like being calm themselves just made me always feel just perfectly normal. Thanks, Adam. We'll pass on to Courtney. Courtney's been with us for all of our patient education seminars in Miami, Philadelphia, and now here. She's uh, amazing. She shows up and does an incredible job. Thanks, Courtney. Go ahead. Hi, guys. I'm Courtney. Um, I am three years post-op, and I had my surgery Cinco de Mayo 2015. And I had my rotting done from T1 to L2. So it was most of my back because I had an S curvature. I was 53 and 36. And I was also a dancer for those of you who are dancers or do sports and, or even if you just like yoga or ballet or anything, like just know that you can continue doing whatever you want to do. Don't be worried that the rods or whatever you decide to end up doing is gonna like hold you back from wanting to progress and to do sports or become a doctor or journalist or whatever, like it will not stop you whatsoever. Um, I continued dancing. I waited a little bit. I wanted to be safe and sorry and I waited six months. I started marking around four months and I went full, full out six months after surgery. So it will take a little time. You're gonna be patient and you'll get, eventually get back to it. And then like my most important advice is definitely to just know don't compare yourself completely to other people's situations because your story is going to be completely different than the person sitting next to you. Whether it's how, many, uh, how much you're getting rotted or your recovery time. Yes, you can look at similarities between other people's stories and yours, but yours is going to be completely different and you just have to take everything step by step. Trust your doctor. You are in the right place. I did not have this before my surgery, and I was missing out because this group, all the doctors, all the patients that you're gonna meet and talk to, this is the most helpful place that you can come to for information and trust, and like, damn well, I'm gonna be corny, but it's literally a family. Like, you will meet so many people, and feel so much better about going through your scoliosis life and you'll definitely feel a lot more comfortable being here in this room. Thank you. Fantastic as usual. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, mom and dad talked a little bit about her this morning and we'll, we'll hear from her. Hi everyone, I'm Marissa. Um, I got my spinal fusion of about, it was just about four years ago. I was a freshman in high school. I had a 107 degree curve. Um, I did uh, spine core bracing for about three years. Did physical therapy, was very against surgery actually. Um, and so we met Dr. Newton and really kind of got a better education on it and heard from other patients. Um, I would agree this whole place is really much like a family. When I was told I was gonna need surgery, I even got letters from previous patients about just their journey. I really only heard bad things about surgery, so it was different and almost just hard to actually accept that there was a good outcome in the end when getting surgery. Um, after I got surgery even, I met so many different people that 
related to me, even though our stories were different. I see Rachel in the audience, and I just want to <laughs> talk about her really fast. We had Spanish together in eighth grade. This is before her and I both got surgery. And then after I got surgery, Rachel's parents contacted my parents saying, Rachel's getting surgery. And we both didn't realize we were both wearing the same brace at the same time in class together. We both didn't know we had scoliosis. And boom, <laughs> we're, we're twins. <laughs> so it's just crazy to see how many people close to you, even in your classroom, have a similar experience. Um, myself, I played almost every sport I could. I played football, I played basketball, soccer, lacrosse. Um, I did some running. I loved PE. I played on school teams. And uh, prior to my surgery, I was told I couldn't run or jump anymore. And basketball, by far, was my favorite sport. So that involves a lot of running and jumping. And uh, I had to stop doing that. But I was able to go ahead and have the option to manage for my high school's team. So I was still involved during recovery. Um, they gave me the option. Nobody really shunned me away because I couldn't play anymore. And uh, overall, I'm so much happier now. Uh, that period where I was recovering and I didn't play sports, I tried finding other hobbies that I could do so I wouldn't just be sitting alone and bored. And uh, it made me anxious, unsure if I could go back to sports. I actually ended up not going back just as a personal choice. Um, I played it safe as well. I didn't want to get hurt. I was very competitive, so I didn't want to hurt myself or hurt anybody else. <laughs> so uh, I just found other hobbies. I liked doing photography and film. And, stuff like that, so that's just something I picked up, but I still am watching like the NBA Finals with my dad, and we're yelling at the TV, and <laughs> still involved with everything, so, yeah. Thanks, and we've heard from uh, Chris's dad already this morning, and then last night at the, uh, our gala, one of the uh, chairmen, do you have any further uh, comments that, from what you've seen so far this morning, and hearing the, your daughter, hearing the other two older ambassadors? Well, I think everybody up here is wonderful, obviously. I mean, they've, they've had an incredible journey. Um, you know, from a parent's perspective, we didn't have this four years ago. Um, and what a difference it would have made for me as a dad. Um, I, I guess I'm a little emotional about it because, you know, it's a, it's a big decision. Even when you talk to your doctor and he looks you straight in the eye and he says, look, there's, there's really no decision here. It's still, you're signing the paperwork, you know the severity of, of this uh, surgery, and um, you don't take it lightly. I think my dog got an earful on the many, many walks with me. <laughs> my dog probably knows more about scoliosis than many people. <laughs> but in all seriousness, um, for people, families who are here that are pre-op, um, and you're going through, you're thinking about it, you're weighing your decisions, you're, you have a level in, of anxiety. Um, I think we're all here for you. Um, we're, if anybody wants to contact our family, like I said, Marissa has talked to many families around our dining room table. And I think it would, would have made a huge difference. I'm just talking f for me now as a father personally, if I could have had that other dad or mom and said, Come see this uh, forum at Rady Hospital, setting scoliosis straight. Come, come listen, come, and, and see the beautiful people up here who, have, who are through the other side and living a great life. And actually, I think their lives have been enriched. Um, not obviously because of the surgery, but just the knowledge and the power now that they have to give back. It's uh, it's huge. So thank you. So. Courtney's mom has been with her uh, for all these uh, patient education seminars. And when you, you see them together, it looks like a great, they're a great team. You can tell that they're, they work and they really support each other. I'd like to have them, I'd like to have Heidi talk a little bit about how, how you worked that out and how you made it work for such a stressful time. Communication. We, we did the research, we educated ourselves, we had complete. It, was, it wasn't only important for myself to have confidence in the doctor, but Courtney did as well. And we were lucky. We're from the East Coast. We're from New Jersey. And we had our surgery at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, also known as CHOP. And we had a wonderful physician, Dr. Sankar, 
um, who we still like to keep in touch with. We send him pictures whether he wants them or not, he gets them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, we needed that confidence in him. And if we had questions, you know, the staff, the because again, we didn't have, I, I call it triple S, so we didn't have setting scolios to straight for us to go to. We did a lot of our, you know, and the internet is full of a lot, a lot of information. Some truthful, some not, some opinionated, some not. You know, it, it, it was important to take and know what your own questions were going to be. Your journey is your journey. And, and I can't stress that enough. Courtney and I have, you know, sat down, we communicated, we, we, let, we made our list of questions. Um, and it was just all about just being open. You know, I had my fears, she had her fears, her sister and brother, she's a triplet, so she, her sister and brother had their own, you know, stresses and concerns. Um, they needed to know what they needed to be prepared for afterwards. Um, what were, you know, some of the places that this surgery could actually end up affecting everybody. So it needed to be something that we did communal. Um, it needed to ha have us unified, and it needed to be something we were well educated and confident with. Okay, sure. Um, for the patients, not only do you need to have confidence in your doctor, but you also need to have confidence in yourself. When I first found out that I was having surgery, I was like really bummed about it. I was like, come on, like, of course this is happening to me. Like first I get like a C on an exam and now I'm having surgery, you know, but, <laughs> but like, I kind of like, I was really bad about it and I was like really not, I wasn't going to say depressed, but I was definitely really sad about it. And I, I was just taking a walk one day and then I was like, why am I complaining? Like. I'm being a baby at this point, like, you're allowed to be sad and you're allowed to be upset about it because it is a big thing. You're going through surgery, like, it's not like you're getting your nails painted or something, but it is a big thing and you're allowed to show your emotions. Don't hold it in. Don't hold your emotions in. And after you let it out, whether it's your best friend, your dog, or <laughs> your family, like, you're, you've got to feel a lot better about it and just know that there is a solution to your problem. You're, there is plenty of doctors, there is plenty of physicians. Like, you have a solution to your problem, whether it's surgery or bracing or even just talking to your doctor on a regular checkup. Like, you do have a solution. Be confident, be positive about it. Like, you'll be fine. You have plenty of people to talk to you. Social media is huge nowadays. Just hit us up, you know. But, <laughs> but yeah, just have confidence in yourself as well, your family, and your doctor. Any questions for any of these experts? I, I want I, if the girls could elaborate on their experience as being an ambassador. What have you found rewarding about that? Because there are going to be patients here who go through the same process you did, and we'd like to pay it forward as well. So can you talk to us about what you've gotten out of being an ambassador? I can't talk too much. <laughs> Um, I um, recently, I, um, after one of my checkups, I think it was my two-year post-op checkup, I got one of the newsletters at one of the appointments, and <laughs> it was a setting scoliosis straight newsletter, and I was like, wow, like, I, I, I was just starting to realize it then, it was just hitting me, like, wow, these, like, these have always been coming to me, and I've never, like, actually taken advantage of this, like, great community here, and, like, I feel like now it's my turn to give back, and, um, it's it's definitely like been a great experience, and um, now I I've, I'm writing the newsletter, the head of the curve newsletter, and it's been such a great experience. And getting to know everyone today, like everyone on this panel and everyone in the audience, it's just amazing. Like I I never knew of all the like people that have like that have like the same have gone through the same thing as me, and. It's just been an amazing experience, and I only wish I like had found this community before I did my surgery, and I'm just so glad I get to be a part of it now. Thank you. I think that's it. We're going to have some more of these this afternoon, so we think of questions over lunch. Thank our experts here on the panel. So.
Uh, so we're going to have now time for lunch, and uh, I'm assuming it's still sunny outside. Uh, so we're going to have lunch outside, and uh, for faculty, we are going to just meet briefly over in the back, uh, and then we'll kind of join everybody. But use this opportunity to see some of the the uh, tables out there and.